I'd love to start off with just finding out a little bit about yourself, you know, giving the, the listener at home as well an insight into your journey, um, both as a, as a founder that we were just talking yeah. about, um, but also, you know, early on as a marketer as well. It's a really interesting tale of kind of three different things. So I went, as I was always a marketing guy. So I did an undergraduate degree in marketing in the 80s, which is not that easy to do back then. Um, and worked for two years and then went back and did a PhD in marketing at a very young age, too young really. But by the end of that, I got offered a scholarship to go to Wharton in the States, which is still probably the preeminent school for marketing in the world. And that combined with the chance to do more marketing led me to become a very young junior professor. And I began teaching in America um, in the, in the mid nineties and then came back to London Business School at the start of the new century. And then from London Business School, moved down here and lived here for a long time teaching at Melbourne Business School. Mm. The thing, so that's kind of my academic career, that's career number one. At the same time though, what made me unusual and actually a very bad academic was I was working in practice the whole time. So for about every day of teaching, I'd do 10 days of consulting work with my own private consulting business, mm -hmm. which became you know, my main job. And I did that for a long time to the point where my academic career was kind of coming to an end because I was full time working all over the world on very big brand consulting work for very big brands, you know, with Dom Perignon or with Baxter, and, you know, for the CMO at the C-suite. And then, um, the final chapter was around about six years ago, I created a course called the Mini MBA in Marketing. And I did that for a couple of reasons. My daughter had just been born and I couldn't spend three weeks of a month on a plane anymore. So I wanted to make money at the same level, but frankly not have to travel as much. Mm. And I was really, back to our point earlier, I was really conflicted with the fact that I could see marketing actually getting worse. The quality of marketing out there was getting worse but I didn't see how business schools were helping much by charging 100,000 bucks for a two-year full-time MBA that none of the marketing generation were ever going to look at. Mm. So I created this online course, and really, it's interesting. Nobody that I approached was really keen on doing it at the time. In the end, we got it up and running. Uh, this is its sixth year. It now is a business that turns over, I don't know, it must be 20 million bucks a year. Wow. Um, and we've trained 30,000 marketers in 80 different countries wow. uh, and we have a net promoter score of plus 80 which beats Mr. Galloway hands down Yeah, um, uh, and it goes from strength to strength. So th those are the three careers, a, 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 a proper academic, uh, a marketing consultant and now a founder of a business which will s certainly see me out and if anything is, is a bigger job than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, I'd love to go back to the early days. Mm. Um, you know, you talked about uh, doing an undergraduate degree in marketing um, and, and then obviously becoming a young professor. And then, you know, when I was like, I've followed you for a while. Um, and, you know, when I look at your CV and I kind of sit there and I log, you know, go on your LinkedIn and I see where you've taught. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there was a stage maybe about four years ago where I think a lot of the universities around the world, they started to bring out these short courses. That's right. Right? And I, I remember sitting there and I'm looking through the different schools. I'm going, wow, like which one am I going to do type thing. So like when I, when I kind of think about going on LinkedIn and looking down your CV, I kind of go, wow, like you, you were someone who really wanted to get after it, if that makes sense, at whatever yeah. you did, you know? And, and so I'd love to talk about your mindset back then and, and even maybe why you went down the academia route before you went, you know, anything. You, you decided to go yeah, any other route. It's an interesting point. I'm pretty, I've, I've been told by many academics, many of them good friends, that I'm not a very good, I'm not a proper academic. I've got a PhD and I've published in journals, but I spent too much time working in practice, right? And they, they didn't mean to be rude, and they were sort of saying, come back to academia, you know. My perspective from the start was I was the only proper marketing academic around because I was doing the job, and then I was teaching and writing about it. And I worked with Baxter, a very famous medical company in Chicago, and they had professors of surgery from all over the world who were like their sort of, you know, advisors. 
And all of these professors of surgery spend three, four days a week doing surgery, and they would also teach. Mm. And I contrasted that with the business school professors who have not done a single day's marketing in their lives, teaching for 20 or 30 years how to do it. And they know deep down that they can't do it. Yeah? But they won't admit that because they're in this position of power. And so for, for me, it was always, I would see myself as a fraud. If I, you know, I, I always wanted to be a marketing professor because I like marketing. Most marketing professors became marketing professors because they wanted to be a professor. That's a big difference, right? Mm. And because of that love of marketing, I was always going to go and do it you, uh, and teach it. And, you know, word spreads with MBA students when they know that someone in the classroom is talking about what they've done recently in a business and bringing it into the classroom. At MIT, it took like two weeks for them to find out, hey, this guy's come over from Australia. And he's talking, my, one of my classes on pricing was what are we going to do with Dom Perignon's pricing? And it was just a photograph. The whole class was a photograph of Dom Perignon being sold in Costco underneath the price we wanted it to be sold at. And I just put it up and I said, right, we've got an hour, an hour and a half, fix it. And the first eight suggestions weren't just wrong. They would have sent that MBA student to jail. So we sort, I sort of put them into jail for the class, you know? And so that I, the word spread quickly that this was a different kind of approach to teaching marketing, which involved doing marketing and then teaching it. So that, that, was, that was my niche. It shouldn't be a niche. I shouldn't be the minority. The system for me is broken, and I don't think you're necessarily dumb to avoid it. Um, I don't need to fix it. I enjoy it being broken because I've benefited tremendously throughout my career from doing it, in my opinion, right doing marketing and teaching marketing and being a practical mm. yeah, version. Mini MBA fills that gap nicely, beautifully as well. So I'm happy with it being, I don't want to fix it. I'm not curing cancer. Let it be terrible. So I have that big niche to play with, you know, for me to be successful. So that, that was the genesis of it. Yeah. And then so obviously, was it a, you know, I, I, and even just from a career standpoint, was it a, what were the tactics, you know, or the, you know, what was the strategy for you personally, you mm. know, as a, as someone who was young, you know, um, you were ambitious and you did, was it, you, did you actively say, Hey, I want to go and teach at these schools. I want to get in front of these people. I want to network with these kind of people. Yeah. To begin with, it was just the, the, you know, it, as a business school professor, you're going to teach MBA students. There may be some undergrads, but it's basically MBA teaching. I was 26 when I became a professor, right? I got an offer from Harvard Business School. I bullshitted my way in to getting an offer to be an assistant professor at Harvard Business School. And there are very few things. I love it that you're going to, that you, you know, like that's, I think that's the difference, right? Between, you know, like you're, you're openly happy to say that because fuck, why not? And that's the fucking truth, right? Well, that is the total truth. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm very good on myself. I, I fancy myself a bit, but there are certain <laughs> things I know I, I could not have done, right? And one of them was be a Harvard Business School professor at 26. <laughs> I'd have got fucking annihilated. <laughs> so what I did in the end was I chose the University of Minnesota, which is a very good school, but it's like 30th in the world. It's not Harvard. The MBAs were younger. The, you know, the expectations were lower. And it was a, I still think it was a smart move. If you read a lot of... Galloway's stuff or anyone else, oh, you take your opportunities and all that. I, I'm still skeptical of that. I think it was a smart move. And I spent four very happy years at Minnesota learning to do it and then went to London Business School, which is a you know, proper top five school. And I really was on my game then. You know? So I think it was a very mature, smart move. Um, and I think it contrasts a little bit with the advice we give younger managers about go for it. You know? And the other thing I'm passionate about is not following your personal purpose. I think that's the advice of old men that have made a lot of money. Mm. You know what I mean? I think as a working class boy myself, the purpose for most people for most of their lives is to pay their rent or mortgage and put food on the table for their kids. And often what we get are men and women that have made it have five million bucks in the bank who are then saying, you must follow your purpose. That's what a 60 year old guy does when he's got more money than he knows what to do with. That's a great thing to do then. But when you're 25, it isn't follow your purpose. It's fucking, you know, buy yourself a car and get a house and, you know what I mean? Without, do what you're good at. Yeah, do what you're good at, and, but also, you know, earn some dough. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's, that's part of it. You have to make some trade-offs, I think, sometimes. It works out well in the end. Most of my consulting was done purely to earn money. It was mm. a brilliant way to earn a lot of money. It turns out it also gave me 100 lifetimes of experience 
But that's not why I did it. I did it for the money, and I'm completely happy to say that, you know? Mm. And, and so, University of Minnesota, you kind of didn't go in guns blazing at Harvard, and then... <sighs> no, definitely not. I went Then I got to London Business School, which was different. LBS was just really getting world class, and it was still very much a more practical school, more so than the American schools. So they, they encouraged you to do executive education. They introduced you to companies who would hire you via the school. So the, that was really useful. I'd chosen to specialize in brand by then because I could see the opportunity. I, I, you know, I'd started off doing communications and advertising, but brand was meatier. I could see it then. You know, the, that was the path I was going to follow. That was gonna, I was going to teach that, do research in it, do consulting in it. It was clearly going to break open. So I focused on that. And then very quickly, I was teaching. So I, I started a class called Brand Management at London Business School, which became very popular. And then very early on, perhaps two years into that, a, a very old woman was sat in the front row of my class, 60, let's say, and wearing a very big fur coat and a pair of sunglasses. So I've got, you know, a class of late 20-year-old international <laughs> MBAs and this 60-year-old woman in a chinchilla coat, right? So... At some point during the class, I sort of inched up. She didn't move, didn't talk to anyone, didn't have any notes or anything. So at some point, I sort of inched up to her and I said, you know, what are you, what are you doing here, you know? And she said to me, with such authority and spite, not spite, yes, yeah, spite, that she scared me, and it was my classroom, she said, that's none of your business. And I'm like, the fuck is this? <laughs> so this was Conchetta Loncio, who's the number two at LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Tennessee. She was looking for a professor to help LVMH develop their brand management capabilities. LVMH, as you probably know, at the time was about 40-something brands, from Louis Vuitton to Dior to Hennessy to Dom Perignon, um, Tag Heuer. So what they were looking to do was kind of systematically learn more about how do we manage these brands. So they'd gone off to find a professor, and they ended up picking me. There wasn't that many choices at the time. And they didn't want it to be French because it was too close to home, but they didn't want it to be American because it was too far from France. So they went with me. I was a good solution. And I, have no, I had no interest in luxury. I had no interest in any of this stuff. I was a brand guy, not a luxury guy, which was, I think, part of the appeal in the end. So I remember, so I went down on the Eurostar, and for the first I don't know, month or so, they, they tried to sort of explain things because they wanted me to work with the brands, with the CEOs, but also teach all their people about luxury branding. So they had to, first of all, get me to learn it, right? And I just had no clue what the hell was going on. It was so different from brand management. And in the end, they sent me out to like, you know, hand, hand out with the guy that makes Verve Clicquot, meet, you know, Monsieur Guerlain, who makes all the perfume, go and visit Dom Perignon, go to the house of Louis Vuitton, yeah, in Annie yeah. And spend a day at Annie Air just hanging out there, right? And we'll come back and get you. And I'm like, what? So I had a game of billiards on Louis Vuitton's billiard table, trying to work out what the fuck was going on, right? <laughs> but they were smart because what happened over time, and it's not a, a, an Anglo Saxon, you know, if it's an Anglo Saxon thing, I'd give you a two by two grid and say, luxury is this, non luxury is that. That's how you get it. The Latin way, the French way is, you'll get it if you're good you'll eventually just absorb it. And at some point, I absorbed it and went, oh, fuck, I get it. I know what's going on, right? And then I started to work for 15 years with the presidents of all the different houses on strategy, on acquisitions, on brand extension, on communications. And it was the most incredible training of all, right? Yeah, to wow. work, to, to follow these men and women, work on these amazing brands on a real variety of projects yeah, everywhere in the world. And looking back on it, I didn't see it at the time. I just thought this was great interesting, lucrative work. But of course, what happened in the end was, again, the experience of all of that it was like having 10 lifetimes of, mm. of brand management. And that really was a big part of my development, to come out of it having built knowledge and worked with people and learned with these great men and women. Then I came out with real experience, you know. And was that the start of the end? Was that the, the start of the end of, of academia? You know, like I, I think so. I yeah. think so. There was... Um, it became a more part-time thing. I was flying from Australia by now to France and to San Francisco and places. So there was a lot of travel involved. And I got to an agreement with Melbourne where it was, they were very good with me. They let me teach brand three times a year. And that's all I did. I was mm -hmm. pretty much out. And then I was consulting elsewhere. And yeah, it was, it was a, it's a wonderful life because when you're a young professor, you're 26, everyone 
just basically doesn't rate you because you're too young. You can feel it when you walk in a room. I did a job once for your cult in Europe, that yogurt brand, and when I got it to the airport, they were all visibly disappointed because I was so young, I must be shit. Really? It, it's not fun being a young professor. But, but I would assume that at some point it became like the purple cow, right? Like it was like there was, there was a, you know, it might have been yeah. someone backed you or, you know, you, you did something and then all of a sudden the yeah. young became, you know... Uh, it turned, a, yeah. It was like, oh, he's young and he's good kind of it, thing. It turned, and I'll tell you the exact moment it turned. And I'm not a huge fan of personal branding f for various reasons. But there was a very important moment when I was at London Business School. I was invited to give a talk to the alumni. You know, so at a business school, these are usually 50-something very important. and they, 500 of them would come back on a Saturday. And I was going to be the warm-up act for Gary Hamill. And Gary Hamill's a very famous strategy professor. He wrote The Core Competence, The Corporation. He's a big name, right? Mm. And I did it mostly to meet Hamill, but also to do this thing. So I worked for, fucking, I don't know, six weeks on this talk about branding. And when we came to the day, I got up on the stage, and I was looking for Gary Hamill, and he wasn't anywhere. I did the talk. And it went down quite well. I worked my ass off on this talk. You know? And then I waited for Gary Hamill. And then I'm sat on the stage, and... He still isn't there, and this giant screen comes down behind me, and they switch a projector on, and Gary Hamill is on the screen, live from his house in California. And I'm like a tiny little figure, and he's like a giant right, on the back behind me. And I have to sit on the stage throughout this thing, right? And he's lit. I can't remember exactly what he's doing. I think he was in his dressing gown almost, but he's, <laughs> he's like buttering his toast, like at his breakfast bar, right? Yeah. And I'm like, you can see in some of the press photos at the time, I'm like, what the fuck is this, you know? And these, the first thing he said, I remember him buttering his toast over, and he said, you know, he said, hi, everyone. He said, I'm Gary. He said, and uh, people say to me all the time, Gary, when you say strategy, wh what do you mean by strategy? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, what the <laughs> fuck is this? He said, well, let, let me tell you what I mean by strategy. No notes, no real content. So I'm going, this is bullshit, right? I look at the audience, they're like this. Oh. Like like Lady Gaga's <laughs> making love to Tom Cruise on a scene. You know, it was yeah, yeah, unbelievable, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? They were like transfixed. So he talks like this for 30 minutes. See ya. And the, the screen goes up again. Everyone goes, massive round of applause. Everybody like shuffles out. I stood at the front there. No one even remembered who the fuck I was, right? I go straight to the pub over the road because I know there's something going on here. Like I describe it as, I've a, a, you know, there's an extra hand in my sweater. I can feel something has happened here. And I have a couple of pints of Guinness and I literally think, what the fuck just happened? And I realize Gary Hamill just taught me something incredibly important. I've just worked my ass off to give a talk on branding and Gary Hamill's been Gary Hamill. <laughs> and people only wanted that second piece, right? Mm. And not only is he so much better than me? I'm a fucking professor of marketing who specializes in brand, and I hadn't seen this. So I vowed, literally vowed at that point, whatever else I do from now on, I'm gonna get to a point, I'm still not as famous as Gary Hamill, but I'm gonna get to a point where people wanna come and see me be me, because me isn't like anyone else, yeah? Now that doesn't mean I decided to be, you know, artificially different. There's lots of people who do that. Right? Mm. There's a guy with a Mohican in Singapore that's like, talks about LinkedIn, and he has a Mohican. And you can just tell he grew the Mohican just to be different. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? You can, it's the yeah. inauthenticity, you can smell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the, the thing with personal branding, if it is what it is, is you can't change your personality like you would change a brand. But what you can do is revel in doing it your particular way and not look for situations where you should follow everyone else which is definitely what I did since and has definitely worked out for me. It's one of those things I think like it takes a situation like that to actually recognize. Yeah. You know, like um, mine's nowhere near on, a, on as big of a scale, but like I remember saying a speech um, in front of a classroom. Um, you know, I, we had this event in Sydney uh, and, you know, I was totally just trying to not, you know, like same thing, just put something on. Yeah, and yeah. It, it actually backfired massively for me. In what way? Someone in the class questioned what I was saying <laughs> and I fucking had no idea how to reply, right? Like, because I was, you know, like like, like you said, it was kind of like the, the, 
the, the stuff I'm talking about, I know, but because I was talking about it not you, yeah. in my own way. You moved too far away. Too far away. And from that day onwards, I thought, fuck that, never again. Just but, be- but you're saying, it, yeah, it, it's absolutely the same thing. It's not a common trait, yeah? It's those that don't learn from that that will be forever making the same mistake. I mean, a lot of the American philosophy about the American dream, it's a lot of bollocks, right? But there's a few things about American culture that are spot the fuck on. And one of the big ones is when you hit those moments of adversity and failure, that's when you find out who you are. And that should be the time where you learn what you need to be to move forward. You don't get that from success. Do you know what I mean? You, you don't, no. It doesn't teach you much. And although it sounds a bit Hollywoody. Those few moments that we're all dealt in our careers is the moment to go, right, I welcome this because I'll find out if I'm really made of good stuff. And second, I'll learn why this was so bad. You know what I mean? And I will change. This won't fucking happen again. Do you know what I mean? I think that's an absolutely key trait. Yeah, amazing. Um, All right, awesome. So I think we're going to get into some marketing stuff now. I listened to a... um, it might have been a presentation you did and you kind of talked about what marketing is and what marketing isn't. Yeah. Uh, I'd love for you to kind of dive into that and, and we can discuss. So we're living in a world, so there's two problems with marketing at the moment. About 50% of those that do marketing don't have any kind of training in marketing. H- hence my, my love that you've done some section four stuff. That's a problem because when you're a consumer, you think marketing is advertising, the tip of the spear. If you haven't been trained in marketing, what you don't realize is it's the tip of a very long spear that goes a long way back. Yeah? And the way to think about what marketing is, is it's really three things. It's first of all, the diagnosis and understanding of the market. No one else in a company does that, right? Understands what does the customer want? What do they think, right? Sales guys don't, don't do that. That's not what they do. And from that knowledge of the market, being able to build a marketing strategy to say, right, we should target these guys with this message, with these objectives, that strategy, yeah? Broader strategy has a wider definition, but marketing strategies, I've just been doing it today. Who are we targeting? What's our position? And what are our objectives? You got that, you got a strategy. You have to have that before you do any tactical execution. Mm -hmm. And the problem with most untrained marketers is they start with Instagram and work backwards. You know what I mean? It's TikTok and I'm done. Do you know what I mean? There's two problems with that. You haven't got a strategy, so you don't really know what you're trying to say or who you're trying to go after. And second, communications, all of it, is only one quarter of the tactical execution of marketing. So proper marketers are doing price, product development, distribution, as well as comms. Shit marketers are just doing comps. Now, if you think about what I've just described, we've got diagnosis, we've got strategy, we've got tactics, and a quarter of tactics is communications. So that's a quarter of a third, yeah? Tactics are a third of marketing. Comms is a quarter of tactics. That's about 8% of marketing. What we have in Australia and elsewhere are marketers who are doing 8% of what marketing's meant to be. And it isn't right, you know? And it's the Gary V's of the world who have shared this viewpoint, who are happy to teach marketing without ever being taught marketing first. Yeah? It's a dangerous situation. I mean, I, I speak bad French, right? If I suddenly turn around and said, you know what, with my bad French, I think I'm gonna create a new version of French, a new dictionary of French. People would laugh at me, because well, you don't speak proper French, but we allow this in marketing. People that don't know marketing properly and haven't been taught it by people smarter than them, um, uh, rewriting the books without knowing the books first. It's a real problem. Mm. <clears throat> so my question... So I guess my question, the, the follow-up question that I would have for that is what, what's the fundamental human flaw mm. that gets people into that position? So, so like, you know, I have a belief that People undervalue ideas, massively undervalue ideas, sure. and that's why the back end of the spear that you were just talking about is so underappreciated. You yeah. know, and that's—I mean—that would fundamentally come from your what you're saying is yeah. like they don't have the training to recognise that. That's right. Um, 
how, so fundament like I, so that, that what is that fundamental human flaw like and why do people listen to the I mean look why do people listen to the Gary V's and 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 you know, if you're a business owner out there and you don't have these trainings, like, what, what do you need to be careful of? Well, there's two problems with the tip of the spear. It, it is the most visible part of marketing, and it is the one that appears to deliver ROI and money, yeah, at least superficially. So there's an easy uh, um, ability to see that that's everything. But the main problem is ignorance. Once you get someone for a day and you explain this, and I've, it's happened to me a hundred times. I mean, I think Gary Vee's a very impressive guy. I don't read his marketing knowledge, but I can take a Gary Vee lover, give me eight hours with them, and they don't hate Gary Vee, but they understand where he's, you know, why he's only 8% of the story. You know what I mean? So it, it's mostly just ignorance and a, a little bit of training so that we can give you, you know, Linguistic French, now you can go out and speak proper French. Do you know what I mean? So that, that's, what, that's the real problem. Education has got this dirty reputation now. I mean, these guys on Twitter that will say, I never went to business school. I've learned everything I need to learn about marketing from these 10 tweets, right? It's very dangerous, right, that we end up in that world because, great, here's 10 tweets, but you, you don't need to do down a formal training. Having said that, as we said at the start of this, I do have, the other half of me has great sympathy for these guys who are saying, I'm not going to business school because business school in most university settings now isn't good enough for the people that want to learn. We've let those people down. So there's, there's two sides to that story, right? Mm. Scott Galloway's a good example of someone who's managed to do both, yeah? I think that's, it's a very impressive thing that, that Scott will talk openly about the failings of universities, but still teach at a university and do it in an applied way. That's why, partly why he's such an amazing guy. Um, so I want to, uh, the next question <coughs> I want to go into is like unpacking um, some of your philosophies and then mm. also the guiding principles and kind of go into, I guess, some of those different dimensions that you talked about around, you know, advertising and um, then we yeah, can yeah. marketing and brand. But um, I guess like uh, there's – actually, no, we'll dive straight into it because okay. otherwise I think we'll get stuck here. Um, I'd love to kind of get an understanding of your philosophies on marketing and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, some of the guiding principles. And, you know, I even preface this as if, if you were walking into a brand new business mm – -hmm. Um, and you kind of had to take over their marketing. Where do we start? And what are some of the big questions we have to answer? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's um, it, there's a standard journey that we built really out of Harvard in the 1960s and 70s, which is the marketing sequence, right? And I structure all my courses that way, and I do my consulting that way. It's probably the best way to do it. Uh, and it's kind of a train. I, I used to teach it as a train track, right? In the sense that the train has to go from the start to the end, and the end is shitloads of cash station. And it has to go through a series of stations. And the first station is market orientation. That's where marketing begins. Market orientation is an incredible mind fuck. And so what market orientation is, is the realization that you are not the customer. You will never be the customer. The minute you sign your contract to join a company, you'll never be able to see what your product or service or advertising looks like. You can't listen to your podcast and ever appreciate it as a listener would because you produce it. Once you know that, you're market oriented. Most Australian marketers don't know that. They look at their ads and respond to them in terms of what they think, whether it's good or bad. You have no opinion. You need to have cold blood in your veins to do proper marketing, right? So stage one is, I know, I know nothing. Literally, you sort of have to break down a marketer. When you do that, stage two is obvious, it's research. We do research because we don't know anything. Qual and quant research builds a picture of the market, the customer, how they decide what they want, what they don't want, what the segments are. We, you know, we understand and structure them. We build a map of the market, right? Often people say, oh, customers don't know what they want. They definitely don't know what they want, but they'll tell you a whole bunch of shit can guide you towards building what they want, right? So when we finish our research, we can segment the market. Segmentation has got nothing to do with the company. It's about the market. I've just spent the morning working for an uh, accounting firm doing a segmentation for them. One of the things I said to them is, if your competitor on the other side of the street was doing this, they should, in theory, come up with the same segmentation. 
we're all looking at the mountain. We're not climbing it yet. You know what I mean? So you build a good segmentation of the whole market, not just who you want to target, the whole market, and now you're ready for strategy. Targeting is who do we want to go after among those segments. Positioning then is how do I want to position my product or service to that target segment and what objectives do I have? So that's the strategy piece. And then so positioning is in relation to competitors? Partly. Positioning is in relation to three things. It's called the three C's. When you position anything, you position, first of all, to customer. What does a customer really want? That's, the, that's, that's your North Star, right? What do they really want, right? When I launched Mini MBA, what they really wanted was confidence, right? Position on confidence. But you also talk to customers because they tell you who the competition is. We don't know who the competition is, right? When you talk to customers, they'll tell you. They won't use the competition word. They'll, they'll talk about alternatives. And what, what's fascinating is most companies don't know who their competitors are because it changes with each different segment. And they're often not the companies that the company thinks they're competing with. So yeah, your positioning is who you're going after, what do they want? Who are the competition alternatives? How do we position against them? And then finally, the company see, what do we offer? Can we deliver on this? You know what I mean? Is it possible? And a lot of the problems with brand purpose is the companies doing it aren't legitimate, right? So I'm looking for the things that the customer wants that I can deliver better than or different from the competition. Yeah? If I can find two or three of those things, I'm going to make some money. And, and the overlay is what they say the value proposition is? Here's where it gets my practical knowledge beats the marketing vocabulary. Positioning is what a business school professor would call it. Consultants might call it a value proposition, brand attributes, brand DNA, uh, brand associations, brand character. It all means the same fucking thing. And one of the things I do with my clients is I say, I don't care what you call it. Call it magic moonbeams, but you've got three brain cells in your target customer's head. What are the three things you want to drop into their head? But don't give me, as every client that's bad has, a brand personality, a brand purpose, brand character, a value proposition, brand flavor, tone of voice. They have these giant decks, and it becomes like throwing shit against a wall and nothing will stick. Tightness. You know, I've, I've done the brand positioning of many billion dollar brands globally. I did Sephora with the team, for example, in France. We got it down to four things, yeah? If we can get a $10 billion company down to four things, you can do it with most brands. Four is a m much harder than 20. So a good position is pretty tight. Yeah? So if I've got my targets and my position and then a few clear objectives about either driving awareness or repeat purchase or consideration, I got myself a strategy. Do you think, like, you know, what we're talking about now is the, you called it a sequence and you're right, 100%. You know, we are a podcast agency now we sit down with customers and we go we're going to take you through this sequence and so on but but i find that and and i'd love to get your opinion because you would have seen both of the sides but companies use this wrong and it's kind of what you were saying before where it's like there's all this fluff and you need the fluff but you shouldn't use it right like it's the <laughs> process of getting yeah. to the eye though you know like you kind of talked about those two or three things and it's really about identifying those you're right, the process becomes God at some point. And what we get is the McKinsey, Bain, systematic but empty approach, right? Where all we're doing is ticking box. Positioning is the perfect example. Most brands have a brand positioning book, yeah? Or presentation, which has seven or 10 slides with at least 45 words in it because the marketers think they're doing the right thing because they followed the process. Or oh, you've got a brand purpose, I'll have that too. Or you've got a value proposition, I'll add that as well. When in reality, the purpose is working against the whole point of positioning, which is when, what is the point of positioning? It's not an end in itself. The point of positioning is what I get my customer to think, what I want them to think when they think about my brand. Done. But you've got to be 55, have a PhD, 100 years of experience to have the confidence to go, no, we don't need all that shit. It doesn't matter what you call it. Tight. Let's work on that. And then let's move move forward to your point. It's easy for me to say it now. At this end of my career, you know, you don't have the confidence in the early stages to go, oh, I think we should probably have this as well. So you end up doing too much. Strategy, ultimately, remember, is what we don't do. It's about making choices. So less is definitely always more. You yeah. Know? 
And, and obviously with the sequence as well, getting the first part wrong, you know, you talked about orientation. You got it. Will almost, ev- you know, inevitably kind of, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're at sequence, the part of the sequence seven, if you get the first one wrong. You got it. You're you fucked. An- you're fucked. And, and I, I teach, I have a marketing exam at the end of the mini MBA in marketing where you have to build a brand, a marketing plan for a fictional company. And the first part of the exam is to build a segmentation. And I say to them, it's only worth 20% of the exam, but also if you fuck it up, you're going to get zero for the rest of the exam. See what I mean? And they go, well, that's not fair. And I go, no, that's exactly what it's like. Do you think, like, uh, and this is just me, I mean, you're going to, I think you're going to understand this and, and have the, the data and the research there. Uh, and we're probably going to get more into this a little bit later on as well, but, like, removing the product Mm. from mind at the very beginning you know orientation yes just getting rid of it yes and then do you think that helps a lot because I've found that since I've started to do that even just with people we're building podcasts for is like you know because like you know we might be working with a corporate company and they've got this product and then they think they attach themselves to this product yes. instead of just going what am I, what's my customer going to what are they interested you're in you're totally right in theory the marketing process doesn't if you notice we haven't mentioned product yet see what I mean so in theory, this process, we haven't even, product comes next, next down the line. In theory, at least, what we should be doing is starting with the market and the need. Now, in practice, that doesn't happen. I think in a 100 gigs, one of them, I didn't have a product to begin with, right? You always end up with a product from Switzerland or it's already done, right? Or it's year two when we're moving around. But the ability to, to your point, to drop it and put it down and look at the customers, because ultimately, the thing that, you know, when you do that market orientation switch, the, the biggest lesson of all is no one gives a fuck about your brand, right? You do because you work on it for eight hours a day and it's your pension and it's your success and it's your ego. But it's just a fucking toothpaste, man, to everyone else, right? Amazingly, marketers are blown away by that, yeah? So the thing you get more than anything else from market orientation is you don't fucking matter and no one remembers you, yeah? So if you look at how branding has changed in the last 10 years, the biggest discovery is salience. And salience simply means, does my brand come to mind when you need it in a buying situation? Every marketer who isn't market orange, well, of course, you know, brand's super famous, thinks, yeah, because they're assuming everyone's like them and they spent eight hours a day working in the brand. What you learn from market orientation is, nah, if you aren't continually reinforcing it, and aiming for salience all the time, you will lose out tremendously. And it's even worse than that. Most of the research now tells us B2B, B2C, doesn't matter. If your brand pops into a head of a customer first, they will rationalize reasons why it's the one to buy. So, you know, when I used to teach brand management, it was have brand awareness, gateway variable, the consumer knows I exist. Now, what do I stand for? This is the important bit, right? It's the wrong way around. Most of it, the reptile brain is which brand comes to mind. Now I'm going to fucking make up a whole bunch of reasons why I'm going to buy that when it's just mostly brute salience driving the purchase. And that's a very big change in how we do things. And it changes how marketers should do things. Most marketers are too uh, risk averse. You know, they're too worried about, oh, this might not be right for my brand. The image might be wrong. And it's like, listen, it doesn't really matter that much. The most important thing is, it's me, it's me. Hey, 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 it's me again. Hey, 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 it's me. I mean, I've done atrocious things in my career, right, to get fame and, and build my brand. I wrote an article about my ass and got influencers to say it was a work of art, yeah, to demonstrate how influence marketing was a lot of bullshit with a big picture of my ass in the, in the article, you know. I've done a talk about um, brand measurement where I've discussed measuring penises as a metaphor for it. Both of these things went down incredibly badly, by the way, right? And do I regret doing them? Probably. But the single goal I have is trade on taste, trade on perfection in order to be, it's me, it's me, notice me, it's me. Because I know that's how the game is played. You know what I mean? Mm. First, they must know it's you. If they don't know that, everything's off. So your point about, you know, put down the product is key to partly get the right orientation, but also because it enables you to realize, oh, my product isn't that important. It isn't the center of my customer's world. That's a great place to start marketing, you know.
Guys, if you're loving this episode, make sure to take a screenshot, give us a tag, or even take a photo if you're watching it. it helps spread the love. It helps us out dramatically. Guys, I just want to say a massive shout out to our major sponsors, BizCover. We are getting some amazing guests on right now. We're traveling. We want to continue to travel and we want to continue to grow the podcast. And the reality is we can't do that without sponsors powering the podcast. And right now we have BizCover on. They're an amazing company uh, and they're powering the podcast. So we want to support them. But more importantly, business insurance. It's something that I had no idea I had to have in the early days. And I'm very lucky that I had someone tell me, you actually need to go get insured because things like professional indemnity insurance and public liability insurance, you just never know when you're gonna need those. Uh, and more importantly, it's really costly if something goes wrong or if you get sued or something of that nature and you don't have insurance uh, and, and that's what it protects you from. And you never know, one day it could save your business from going under or putting your business back in a time where you are growing in and you are making an impact. Uh, so BizCover, the link is in the show notes. Um, they will, you know, the, the, the great thing about it is there's no um, paperwork in, involved and you can get insured in less than 10 minutes. So the link is in the show notes, BizCover, go check them out, get yourself a good deal. Okay, so full circle now. And yep. again, this is me just being curious and yeah. kind of chucking it at you. We talked about at the start the Gary V's of the world mm -hmm. where they haven't done the marketing education mm -hmm. but they've been really good at what we just talked about. Brilliant, brilliant. Right, that very first piece of the puzzle. Is that the reason that happens? You know, is that the reason why, you know, and, and you know, that fundamental flaw of humans giving, you know, just kind of the, the influence and, and so on but fundamentally we think that with social media coming in, you know, into play in what the last... 10, 15 years, yeah. that's kind of... Because the, these people have been really good at doing that first bit and then that's... The, you know, again, you said this, but that's all that matters now to the eyes of the person with the, the yeah, education. Yeah, it's the, it's the Paris Hilton school of, of success, right? Mm. It's the Cardassian school. You can now, through sensation and just you know brute presence in these new channels, make yourself famous. And fame is probably the single biggest driver of brand success. If you can generate that, most of the rest of it comes along with it, right? So yeah, I think you cannot, you know, I don't know what uh, Gary's worth these days, he's, you know, company's worth 150 million bucks, whatever at least, right? It, it's born of really clever entrepreneurial uh, building of a brand. But I have a problem there too, right? And not that I would ever go at Gary because he's a decent human being, but what Gary also often does, as many of them do, is parlay their experience to others, which is nonsense. That's not advice. That's the way you need to do this is the way I've done it. N no, <laughs> that's not consulting. That's survivorship bias. You see what I mean? True. That's that's where you you know because I it's it's that's the consulting that, that you know the experience. It's absolutely right. Yeah. When you learn to consult properly, you learn to listen and not dispense the same advice to every client. I mean, LVMH was, again, a great lesson school for me. When you've got 55 different brands, we've got Benefit Cosmetics, right? A $20 mascara. We've got uh, Berluti shoes, $10,000 shoes, right? Both have to operate in the same company. I have to work with t people from both teams. So the first thing you learn is what works for one will not work for another. Pull it back, right? What we get with a lot of self-made experts is, let me tell you how I've done it, follow my path. Well, you've already done that path and it was right for you, but it's not gonna be right for other people. You have to have a system rather than this singular simplistic piece of advice. And that's where your belief system of the education yeah. mixed with the experience is, is a really good recipe for success. It is, and consulting has many drawbacks. One of the great advantages of consulting is you get to live a thousand years. Right? When I talk to my mini MBA students, I describe myself at one point as Yoda. When we get to segmentation, I'm, I'm Yoda, right? And I'm Yoda in the sense that I've lived, this is not an exaggeration, I would have done easily two and a half thousand segmentations in my career, right? Most marketers will do, because if you do the numbers, right? If I've had 50 good clients each of them averaging five countries with an average of 10 brands per country. I've helped build, review, change, adapt, right? I've lived for two and a half thousand years. Most marketers will build a segmentation five or six times in their career, see what I mean? So consulting has that great benefit. It does have superficiality of it speeds up your experiential curve. If you ever meet a guy that's been at McKinsey for 10 years, he or she is 
approximately 50 times more experienced than someone that went into a blue chip company. Mm. It, it is a great advantage of that lifestyle. All right, quick question before we move on. Mm. I've got a belief system that every company will have a podcast in the next five years. What do you reckon? I reckon Based on the conversation we just had, because it's 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 for me, it's reinforcing my belief, and that's why we're doing this. Like we're we no. a year ago we were in it, and it's because of that orientation. It's the the very beginning of the sequence. It just makes too much sense. It does and it doesn't. Right? I, maybe. I think the better question is which companies do you want to work with to develop podcasts? Do you know what I mean? In the sense that you can't do them all, right? I mean, you're thinking more like a private equity guy. When I've worked with private equity guys, what fascinates me about these dudes, right, is they look at the category first and then they try and find a brand. So when they've worked with them, they've gone into, you know, you get tied up in these incredibly careful do legal documents, what I can and can't say. But when they're looking to buy a certain, let's say a watch retailer, right, they bring me in to assess four brands, but they've already decided they want a watch retailer because the category just has the right dynamics. So they start category and then they pick brand, which is completely the wrong way around to me. Do you know what I mean? But what you're saying is podcasts are the thing. We can do a good podcast within it. I'm not saying it's the wrong way to do it, right? A, a brand guy goes, I mean, I don't, you know, I just want to work with my clients and beat everyone else in the marketplace because we're better than them. Do you know what I mean? You should be, you know, targeting a particular group of people and saying, right, we're going to build podcasts just for you guys. That's what we're doing. Like, we've done that. But it's, yeah, it's right, just right. interesting, like, like corporate, like, you know, big companies, you know, it's the idea of capital and time, the, the fight between both of those things. But it's, yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion. Well, no, I, I would say, the one thing I would say to you that I know you're probably right is because on Mini MBA, we've evolved over six years. And one of the things that's evolved, many things, one of the reasons we're better than Section 4 is we've dispensed, we've all almost all readings and everything is podcasted now, right? So that we have an ability now for busy people that do our course when they're walking their dogs or driving their car or in the gym, they're also learning. And we've just got enormous response from that. And it's, it's a more powerful technique than reading a document. And there's a real humanity and learning effectiveness from it that it just, you know, jumps out. Yeah, I just think it's the, it's the I mean, look, like it's the greatest medium to, to build a customer relationship right now. I think you, Agree. You, you're not going to get 40 minutes of your customer's time. Like well, I, this, I, you know? I think you're right. And the best thing, I've, I wrote an article about it recently. Russell Brand used to do a very good podcast. He was a very early podcast yeah, yeah, pioneer. Yeah. This is 10 years ago. And he ended up on a commercial podcast for a while. And he's quite a social, you know, social Marxist uh, kind of guy, anti-capitalist for sure. But they had to read out these ads each time on the show, him and his, his producer, Matt. And so he would get into them and take the piss out of them and rip apart the messages, right? And Matt was obviously being told by the producers, mate, you've got to get this sorted, mate. You can't do that, right? And yet that was the greatest podcast advertising I've ever seen. Because rather than a two-minute announcement, it went on for 10 minutes. It went in and out, ripped up, torn up. You know, <laughs> see what I mean? And back yeah. to my point about salience, you lost a bit of control. But fuck, it was brilliant for the brands who were trying to pull out of it in the end. Do you know what I mean? So I think if you were to do podcasting because of that intimacy, but also master the idea that you don't need ads like any other format. Do you know what I mean? You can do ads your own way and integrate them into the content you know, in a way that's the style of the show. That's the way to do it. I'm so disappointed with Netflix, right? All Netflix is going to do with their advertising is like expensive TV ads. There was so much opportunity there. Why couldn't they do one brand a day across all the shows? Do you know what I mean? Like there was, mm. there was a way of, you know, it, it sometimes is disappointing that people aren't more attuned to that, you know? 100%. All right, so I've heard you talk about brand purpose. Yes. Uh, and I think, I think it's really important for people to hear the, your kind of point of yeah. view on this because as a company, and more importantly as a startup, you can get sucked into that, right? You can get sucked yeah. into talking about the the mission and the vision in a way that doesn't it just loses any type of real you know grunt so i'd love for you to talk about yeah. it and, and you know we can kind of run through that it's a bit of a disease at the moment in marketing interestingly with the recession it's about to really change we should talk about that too um so what happened about 10 years ago is we started thinking about brand purpose and it's partly because, again, we forgot that point about brands being small things. We overstated their importance. People want, my, you know, people want buy me unless they know that I have a certain viewpoint on certain political issues. And, you know, 
No one gets, open your refrigerator tonight when you go home. Open those doors. Look at all the products inside and ask yourself how many of those were purchased because of your knowledge of the purpose behind those brands. What a load of nonsense, right? Yeah. Having said that, I, I'm in the middle ground. So I'm very anti anyone that says, as many people do, without brand purpose, your brand will fail. That's horseshit. But so is the idea that all brand purpose is nonsense. That's also horseshit. Purpose is a strategic choice for a brand. Yeah, it's a choice. It fits some brands beautifully. For many more, it's something that you shouldn't distract yourself with. I'll give you, and it plays out very nicely with Unilever. So Unilever is a, <clears throat> an amazing company, has about 50 brands. They have Dove, which you know, is probably one of the great purpose-based stories, a 20-year story of the campaign for real beauty, a true purpose, building an incredible um, commercial success. But again, they made an enormous error, which is they assumed, therefore, that all the brands in their portfolio should have a brand purpose. Mm. Now, it works for Dove. They also own other brands like Pot Noodle, right? Try finding a purpose for that. They're trying, right? Um, Hellman's mayonnaise is a great example. So their positioning for Hellman's at the moment is it will help to reduce the global waste mountain, yeah? Now you imagine a girl in St. Kilda, right? Who's 45 years old, a bit worried about recession and all of that, and she goes in the supermarket and there's Hellman's. The reason you should buy Hellman's is it's gonna help to reduce the food mountain, right? It, it's, it's, it's embarrassing, right? Now what's happened, so there are brands that it works for and brands that it doesn't. And it doesn't work for a lot of brands because consumers don't give a shit, because competitors can't deliver on it often. And in many cases, all the brand purposes sound the same, so there's no competitor cut through, you know, making the most of today and all that shit. You know. The recession is coming, and the analogy I use is the cat, the recessionary cat is now being set among the purpose pigeons. If purpose really works, it should protect you from customers trading down and saving money. If it's a lot of bullshit, you're in deep, deep shit. And very subtly, the big marketing people that have pushed purpose all this time are pulling back. Unilever are now saying, oh, you know, it's the icing on the cake, but the cake is the most important thing, right? That's a completely different point of view. Mm. Mark Pritchard, who runs marketing for P&G, who's a very good marketer, but has made his own errors with Gillette and things, said recently, he, he changed the mantra of P&G to being, we do, we, do, uh, we, do great, we do good and also we do growth. And he changed them around. And he said, actually, no, it's most important we talk about growth, but we also do good. But our priority should be growth. So I think what's happening is we're starting to get a little bit more nuanced about it. You, we you, needed that, though. Do you think it's because they can, I mean, in a thriving economy, you can get away with it? Uh, totally right. I mean, in a thriving economy, you can get away with anything. And look, it doesn't do harm to have a brand purpose, but the opportunity cost of focusing on food mountains rather than on it tastes good, or even better, you know, in the recessionary world, you know, the great thing about Hellman's is you can take shit in your fridge and make a good meal out of the you know, second day's product, you know, and, and it will taste great. That's, a great. that's a great recession message. When you waste your bullets on reducing the food mountain, you don't hurt your brand, but you miss the opportunity to promote. And to your point, yeah, when the tide comes out economically and everyone's trading down a private label, you can't afford to do that shit anymore. It's an indulgence. Yeah, and I think it's a, I think it's just like, especially for like our listeners, you know, they're either thinking about starting a business, they've started a business, and, and they're kind of in a startup phase. But like, you can easily get sucked into seeing some of these brands, like, you know, like, you know, um, larger brands and they have this big fluffy really broad statement and and they push that brand yeah. purpose and then you go well hang on i need to do the same thing and That's really right. your job as a startup is to capture this little minuscule of the market totally and really just survive you know, survive I mean, yeah. right like just try to get in get a few customers and then you know, get it going, but I think... And most of these brands with these big highfalutin brand purpose statements, that's not the reason they're big anyway, right? It's just because they're being indulgent, yeah. So, yeah, make, for your listeners, I'm not saying don't do it, I'm saying make purpose a strategic choice. Is it really what your customers want? Is it really how you want to roll? And will it give you differentiation in the market? Then go with God and do it. Mm. You're going to find eight times out of ten, though, consumers want more prosaic things. Do you know what I mean? They're not that interested in this stuff. Marketers are, because I'll tell you something else about marketing. Most marketers are now embarrassed 
to make a good product, make a good revenue, and make a good profit. At some point in the, in the noughties, it has become embarrassing or not enough simply to make a good product, have a satisfied customers, and, and generate a great profit, which is something I think is the ultimate purpose of businesses. Don't rate the planet, treat everyone well, you know, I'm not saying don't, don't, don't you know, be evil, but what I'm also saying is the purpose of business is to turn the economic wheels and delight customers. There ain't no shame in that. Mm. And particularly for entrepreneurs starting a business, if you can make a profit, uh, and something else I'd like to say here, which is really important. I, got, I once got drunk at the Tasmanian Business Awards. It's a long story. <laughs> but they gave out all these awards and I got really hammered. And I, we had lots of Tasmanian whiskey. And I went completely off script, but it, people were crying at the end because I gave this emotional speech, which I can't remember. Um, and I said to everyone in the room, you fuckers have all made a profit. And I know how hard that is. And I celebrate you because you've made a profit. Remember, the world we live in is obsessed with revenue. Revenue means nothing. Like this, we're, look, this beautiful table between us, right? Looks like it cost about 500 bucks, right? I could take that out in the street now and sell it for 10 bucks and generate a revenue. There, there ain't no glory in that. But if I can take this table that costs 500 bucks and sell it for two grand, that's a good thing. See what I mean? It's the generation of profit, not revenue. And that's important because if you want to generate revenue, you end up doing lots of dumb things. You target everyone, you make too many products, you run sales promotions, right? If you understand profit, you do exactly the opposite. You have less products, you never run a sales promotion, you never discount, right? You focus on a particular customer because they'll pay the most. Yeah? There's a big difference in those two things. And watch out for people that conflate them. And I learned that from a guy called Gilles Hennessy, who was the seventh son of Richard Hennessy, who created Hennessy. I'd been working in San Francisco for benefit. They'd just broken, I think, a billion dollars. And I'd come over to New York City and we were working with Hennessy. And, I, and, and Gilles was a wonderful man, but he was tough and mean, you know, and always smoking a cigarette and very stylish inside the office in New York. And someone in New York would always say, I'm sorry, sir, you can't smoke. And he'd be like, just, yeah, okay, whatever. Yes, I can. <laughs> and I came into this meeting at 8.30 and I was just talking to the guys I knew from Hennessy. And at one point I said, hey, guess what? Benefit Cosmetics broke a billion dollars last year. Can you imagine that? How, how good that's been? How much they've grown all that way? Didn't they? And from the back of the room, Gilles says to me, how much profit? And I said, uh, oh, I, I don't know. And he said, long draw on the cigarette. And maybe you shouldn't talk about it then. <laughs> brand is margin, right? It, it's the most important thing about brand. It isn't driving volume. It isn't getting distribution. It's the ability for it to reduce price sensitivity. That's the number one reason you want a brand. Otherwise, you're a commodity and the Chinese are going to beat you. You know what I mean? Never forget, that's the biggest single advantage of a brand is drive down price sensitivity. And if you're a good marketer and you can price that in, Incredible margin, yeah. And, and again, because marketers are not involved enough in price, they miss all of that glory. You know what I mean? Which is the main job. It's not. You don't need more customers. You need the right customers, and you need the right pricing. Yeah. And remember, with inflation coming, right? We'll go for inflation here. Five percent this year, five percent next year, whatever they're going to estimate. That's ten percent off. You know, our, our value. So we're going to have to put up prices. So it's crucial that we remember that or we'll eat it and we'll be much less profitable next year. So my next question was going to be, actually, before we go into mm. that, could, are you able to just articulate what you just said there? Because it was a really great point, but mm. I think it was also very quickly run over where it's, you talked about being a commodity and the difference in yeah. the tactics behind that. Yeah. And then the, the, you know, not, you know, the actually really building a great brand and kind of the, the other side of that, that coin. So, so the traditional definition of brand that I like the best, when you have to, you know, what's, what is a brand, right? Is take any brand and subtract the commodity equivalent and whatever's left over is the value of the brand, right? So if you take Coca-Cola and you subtract cola, generic cola from that, whatever's left over, images, associations, good stuff, bad stuff, is what the brand has. And if that's mostly positive and valuable and distinctive, that's going to give you that price premium and that demand and that growth that everybody seeks. So when you develop your strategy for a brand, what you're trying to do is make sure everyone knows who you are 
and then make sure those two or three things that you want to stand for from positioning get into the customer's head. So when I say, look, brand minus commodity equals what? The things you positioned on are the things that pop into the customer's head because that's what they want. And we're in business. If you run a brand like a commodity, all you do is you chase sales, you do what everyone else does, um, and you end up maybe making some revenue, but at shitty price points and always getting crushed by a bigger or overseas you know, alternative. You, it's a mugs game, right? When I, was a, when I was a young man, this might be helpful for some of your younger male listeners. When I was a young man, the myth was you would always meet your uh, girl, future wife or girlfriend in a, in a nightclub, right? So every Friday and Saturday night, most normal men can't dance without being incredibly inebriated. So we'd go out and drink enormous amounts of beer, go on the dance floor, stick it out on the dance floor and hope some woman was like interested, right? Which they inevitably weren't, right? Even when you did get a woman to eventually come and dance with you, at some point they'd spot a taller, better looking dancer on the other side of the dance floor. There's only one good looking guy in the discotheque. Do you know what I mean? What you learn in your 30s, some men learn, some men never learn this, is that you have to target a specific woman. I don't want to say stalking, that's wrong, but target a particular woman, <laughs> invest in dinner, pretend to like their friends, pretend to like their parents, and pull off that magic trick, which I did with my wife, which is... Hey, I think you know anyone who's got a partner right now can attribute 100% of what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely right. And women do it as well with men. They target a specific man and they do the, you know... I did it with my wife. I convinced her somehow. I love this. I love this so much. <laughs> no, I had to convince my wife to love me for who I am. She meets better looking men every day. Right? She might have met one right now, as far as I know, right? So far in 20 years, she hasn't gone off with them because no one is more me than me, right? So the analogy for branding is you're focusing not on doing a podcast company, but on delivering A, B, and C to clients around the world of podcasts that no one else can offer as well as you can. If you do that, you get the price premium and the growth. Yeah? So commodity generic thinking is the thing to avoid. Yeah? And brand distinctive, differentiated thinking is the thing to go for. Yeah, 100%. I mean, to give, uh, I guess to put this into, an, uh, a, I guess, a real life situation, the reason we got the studio, like we started this a year ago, the reason we got the studio, the reason we got the setup and we invested in this upfront was because we didn't want to be a commodity. We wanted to have the best looking content that there was. Um, mm. And then, you know, you, you go from there because that's how we knew we could be differentiated. We go. could penetrate the market. Uh, and even now, further on, is like as a brand, you know, we, our brand's called Pivotal Conversations. Um, but, you know, just the little things around, you know, we are, we just, you know, we're, we're, we call ourselves snippet engineers. <laughs> Right? I like it. Because we inevitably, what we're trying to say is you can have the best. Now it's you can have the best cameras. Yeah. You can have this. You can have that. But you're not going to be able to replicate what we can do with a snippet. And this, yeah. is, this is interesting to me because this is the bit where some of it is from the beginning is intended. But if you study any of the brands that you work on, you know, that you, particularly the older ones where you follow their history, a lot of it is stuff that happens slightly later in the early years and which you, you learn, you know, you sort of learn on the side. With mini MBA, for example, we, I always set up, it was going to be MBA level, it was going to be about confidence, but the other one that we learned on the job was convenience. That, every, you know, I'll give you a great example. When we do, everyone asks me when they sign up for the, pod, for, for the course, they say, um, what time are the scheduled classes? And I go, there aren't any times. We, we, we do a weekly module with the classes and the readings, but times don't exist, partly because we have 60 countries and partly because we found that even if it, everyone was in Australia, they can't make two o'clock every week. You know, it doesn't mm. work. Now, the flip side of that is you can just dump all the content on a web and it's just a bunch of videos. That doesn't work either. So each week the class is ready. It's all fresh and lovely, but it's available for you at any time. We didn't start with that approach. We learned it and convenience became the third strand of our brand, like snippet engineers, right? It doesn't keep going for long. In my working with 100, 200, 300 year old brands, the first faltering years of the business are when these things accidentally tend to get locked into place. You know what I mean? It's about, uh, you know, I, I agree. It's like, 
And I think this kind of, again, is full circle back to your point about when you understand these principles back here, mm. you get these inputs, right? And these inputs come from certain events that you kind of happen in this in your startup. And, you know, for us, it's working with clients, having snippets that go viral, 2 million views. And That's then the, the smile that puts on the face of the customer. And then it's like this aha moment, right? And I think like... The, the and, and you know like I know how to leverage that now there like you go. we're going and trade we've trademarked it we've put in a, a thing we're going after it right and I think it's like the understanding that when you have these principles there and you are in you know the startup or you, you're kind of going through that experience you can kind of understand when this event happens how I can grab that and run with it that's it and often it we talked about it earlier there are often moments of uh, challenge or weakness that you have to surmount which produce this ability. You know, if you look at Louis Vuitton and um, the monogram, the most famous, you know, design in luxury, it was in response to 19th century counterfeit versions of their bags. So they just came up, you know, with the monogram to respond to that problem. And then they went, oh, hang on, this is good. We'll, we'll keep this, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Often in those early stages of a brand's history, you get these things locked in. And I love that about brands. I love that journey where they sort of swirl around and then they coalesce. What happens if you guys stay in business for 30 or 40 years is then we get a different challenge, which is I have my DNA, I have my brand. I don't want to change it. But what it now means to a different generation means that there's a trick of consistency here, right? That over time, in order to be, to be true to my brand, I have to change what I do, yeah? That what cool and sexy and hip meant in the 1990s is totally different in the 2020s. So I have to change the paradoxes. I have to change my tactics in order to stay true to my brand. And if I don't change the way I do it, I will become inconsistent with my brand. And that happens around the 30, 40 year mark in my experience. And it's really challenging for brands because you have to take, you're not repositioning them. You take them back to the history and go, this is what we stood for. Now we have to change what we do to get back to that in a different way yeah it's so interesting so we talked about you know we were talking before al roseby mm. took over country road the first thing she did is she went and sat with the owner from you know who was you know an old man and and sat, sat with him for three days and just said what's the heritage and then you know over however long it's been she's really brought that back to the she, she's a smart she's a smart woman and and that sounds obvious it's not obvious to take that time i worked with donna karen in new york and in a similar way you know donna karen had gone in 40 years had been this fiery incredibly hot brand but had kind of gone off the boil a little bit and it was trying to get donna trying to say to donna we don't want you to tell us what to do we just want you to talk about the 1980s and what was going on then so we can distill that out and try and do it again in a modern way, right? So she, mm. she's doing exactly the right thing. We're not gonna try and copy the past, but we're gonna try and work out what the magic stuff was and then revisit it in a modern way. It's, it's one of the, brand revitalization is one of the hardest but most valuable things you can ever do. Yeah, it's just interesting to hear you talk about it and then be able to ma marry that with a company that's done it. I yeah, think that's the beauty it. of learning for me. Like that's that what it, what just happened just then is the epitomizes why I love it so much. And she knows her stuff, right? Because it's not obvious. And what's great about it is there is that meeting of people, especially as you get older, and you both know what's what's what. Now, there is a standard approach, right? Mm. When you really know your onions, and we all know it, you know. It's very interesting reaching your fifties because two things happen: you start to identify people who know their shit. And also, it's clear that if you hang out with the right people in your 20s and 30s, you cannot not be successful because they're all your mates are now, if they're relatively good, in very senior positions. And it's too late to find new friends. I could have literally 10 times my consulting income now because I've worked with good people all over the world who are now CEOs. And they have, you know, I might not have been the best guy they ever met, but they know I'm good and they haven't got time to find someone else. You know what I mean? Like, so if you're good and you hang out with good people in your early years, that network is incredible. You know what I mean? It's so sad I can't use it, but I can't. Yeah, so true. Um, quick one before we jump into quick fire, mm. which is our last little segment. Sounds I'll explain, good. yeah. I'll yeah, explain. yeah, that sounds good. Um, what's the current landscape looking like? 
in marketing now? Because obviously we've got TikTok on the scene, and and I know that's the edge of the spear. That no, but it's interesting. It's mm. interesting. I don't think. Here's my uh, Galloway style prediction. I'm pretty certain they're going to shut TikTok down in the states first. Yeah. The reason I know that is it's an interesting example. I wrote an article about two months ago saying it's bullshit the way Facebook, Google, everyone, right, even Amazon are creating TikTok clones and running them. I mean, Instagram has got in big trouble because it's basically tried to turn itself into TikTok. Its own customers had to say, please don't do this. We've got TikTok for TikTok. We want Instagram to Instagram. So I wrote a long column saying, how disappointing that these guys can't compete. And then I literally read my own column and went, oh, hang on. (laughs) There's a reason why all these companies are developing TikTok clones. They know something that no one else knows yet. The US government's going to shut it down because it's Chinese. So that's my prediction for TikTok. Um, That said, it's been an amazing engine, an amazing engine, which has incredible potential if it doesn't get shut down, which it will. Um, (laughs) So TikTok's there. Look, I think the big theme at the moment for me is definitely the, the specter of recession we, won't, you know, we live in the lucky country. We won't have too bad of it here. You've got to remember up in the UK, they're looking at 18% inflation, right? And a real tricky 10-year ten, period, right? The worst in living memory. Um, US, everyone's cagey about as well. We don't know, right? So there's a feeling that we've had an amazing run since the GFC that's definitely materially now coming to an end. I think that's the dominant two-year thing. I think we've come out of coronavirus... An interesting one as well. We have a lot of what I call disaster monkeys who are like, oh my, coronavirus will change everything. Read my book. Coronavirus has clearly changed very little. I think the recession will classically have a much bigger impact. You know, there are famously about 8, 10% of brands that come out of a recession stronger, and it tends to be a changing of a guard. You know, it tends to happen sometimes. So I think that's the big thing for the next couple of years is, as you said earlier, the sort of luxury of being in a growing inflated market and now, you know, doing brand purpose stuff, how that translates into a much more parsimonious time is, is, is an interesting uh, period of change. Yeah. And I think, I think as well, like, you know, just as a spectator, it's going to be interesting, interesting to watch how some of these big players yeah. maneuver their way through it. Cause I think they're the ones you can learn from. That's right. I mean, P&G is the classic one. The way P&G handled the pandemic was so brilliant to watch, right? Everyone else was pulling back. Coca-Cola, like, cut two-thirds of its global budget, which didn't make any sense. And John Moller, who became their CEO, was the CFO at the time, went on TV and just went, and they asked him, are you pulling back with coronavirus? He's like, no, we're doubling down. We see this as a service to society, to our customers. We've been here before. You know, we're 150 years old. We know what happens. We're doubling down. And it was a moment of pure leadership, right? just pure leadership. See this big fella go, look. And, and a lot of leadership wasn't on display at that point, right? Mm. But there's all this bullshit about leadership is empathy. Leadership is understanding. Leadership is taking care of your team. It's horseshit, yeah? It's horseshit. Let me tell you what leadership is. It's making the call, not necessarily the right call, and getting everyone to follow, yeah? That's what they needed during coronavirus, and that's what they didn't have. They had a bunch of people, like headless chickens, empathizing, It's not what leadership is. When coronavirus came, it was, right, this is what we do. John Moller was doing it. It was like, we double down, we'll grow our brand share at the expense of everyone else's pulling back. That's our playbook, go. I'll go on TV and I'll tell everyone, we're gonna do this. It was incredibly impressive. Mm. We still have this leadership is empathy BS, right? Great, continue with the BS. It's not a big part of leadership in my opinion. Having worked, I'm no leader myself, but I've worked with great leaders. It's about making the call. And not necessarily the right call because there is no such thing. And it can go the other way, right? Like the right call may be pull back, right? And it's totally. independent to the, to the, to the totally. company because I think it goes the other way where people don't make the call in a position where they should make the call. I, I love that too. And the other one that I would always say to you, we used to talk about in business school, there should be an extra board in business school when you do a case study. The other option we don't talk about is do nothing. That's a very wise thing sometimes. Strategically doing nothing is different from procrastination, right? Mm. Do nothing and let's just see what, how this plays out. It's a smart play. It's a, it's a rare leader that will go, you know what we're going to do? Nothing. Let, let everyone kill each other. Let it play. Yeah. Step back. Yeah. Just let everyone make mistakes. Or, or let's just see. You know, in two, mm. mo- in two more cycles, we'll make a call. But what happens in business school when you're doing a case, you, know, you break down a business school case, everyone says, do this, no, do that. 
there's very rarely a very bright MBA will say, what about if we just don't do anything and we just sit back and let it tick over? It's like, yeah, let's put that on the board. It doesn't go on the board enough, you know? Mm. All right, we're going to dive into quick fire now. Ready. Right. Okay. We're going to, I always have to preface this. We, okay. We call it slow fire. Slow fire. There's no real, it doesn't, nothing's changing in this segment. You can say whatever you want, but these are just kind of questions okay. that we ask everybody. Love it, love it. One piece of advice for your younger self. I'll get laid more. Um, I uh, I look back on it now. I don't have a high, I don't think I'm some kind of gorgeous dude, but I look back at pictures of myself when I was like 22. And if you'd have asked me at the time, I'd say, ah, oh, like, I'm, you know, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that hot. I was quite good looking. I should have got laid more. <laughs> All right. Love it. Um, I can make something up if you want, like about, you know, trust your inner soul or something, but that's not what I would find. If hey. you gave me the, if you give me three minutes of myself, I'm like, listen, hey, you're quite good looking, get laid more. <laughs> I love it. You're the, you know, the, it's, it's, it's probably why. It's me talking to me, man. Yeah. I get to decide, right? <laughs> hey, 100%. Um, all right, so what advice would you give someone who's just starting in business? Um, a couple of things. I would say uh, I really like working in retail as an initial place to learn. I don't know many people that that started their careers in retail that didn't develop much more quickly and more robustly. So don't look down at retail. As a, you know, there's a there's a sort of mindset in Australia that you're better off working in Nike's headquarters in Sydney than working in a in a sneaker sales floor running a small you know uh, running shoe sales company in Melbourne. It's the wrong way around. Get close to the customer, run a store handle turnover you know handle a small team it's a brilliant way to learn and be entrepreneurial so don't be snooty about retail it's a great place to start out um I, i'm not convinced about the mentoring thing everyone says get mentors i'm not sure man bad advice is as dangerous as good advice is useful i think that's overstated i think um being able to as we said earlier to see those moments where you get smashed really is great welcome them Welcome that feeling of, you know, I've just been smashed by this. You'll learn. It will make you a stronger person. Mm. We all get those moments. You know, I remember Karl Lagerfeld, the designer, saying, someone asked him if he was nervous for a fashion show. He said, oh, no, I welcome these moments. You know, it's, I know I'm alive. You know, it, it's a brilliant attitude. And then the last one is that purpose thing. Don't listen to old men and old women telling you to find your purpose. It's indulgent wank from old men and old women that have got 10 million bucks in the bank. You need to get bread on the table. You need to pay and learn and travel. I'm not saying do a job that you don't like, but you know, there's, there's so many kids trying to become computer game programmers because they like computer games. Do you know what I mean? That's what your purpose is when you're 17 and you don't know fuck all. You know what I mean? That's my purpose. What, 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 what's my passion in life? Computer games. I'm going to become a computer game designer. No, you're not. You know what I mean? Travel, earn some dough, live a bit, and... You know, don't expect that, you know, the thing that you do will be all aligned together. I think that's really dangerous, you know. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Uh, have you read The E-Myth? No. No, they talk about primary aim and it's like, yeah, it's a business book, but they tell you, well, what's your primary aim in life first? And so it, I think it's not, it's, it's kind of what you're saying where it's like, well, what really fucking matters to you? Mm. And go do something that's going to fucking enable you to do that. Exactly, and and I think and they say talk about okay, and this is a business book. It's like primary aim, then uh, you know strategic objective. Oh, that's that's good. I like that. I mean, I, I think that the separate. I mean, again, it might be because I'm very working class. I, I don't need to work to to entertain myself. You know, what I mean, I have other things I can do. I like to drink wine and dig holes and walk my dogs and be with my family. I don't feel the need for work to satisfy. I can go home tonight and do things that make me happy that aren't work. Yeah. I don't see any problem with that separation. Do you know mm. what I mean? I, d I really don't. I've done jobs that have been very painful and hard, but then I can go home and enjoy myself and I've made a shit ton of cash. So it, that's okay. You know? Yeah, 100%. All right, so what's the most important trait that a founder must have for success and why? <laughs> it's very hard to have one general trait. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I guess I, I might be the best qualified person in the world to answer this, so I better think about it. I suspect it's the ability to be able to have kids that carry your genes. If I've learned, I'm sorry, that's a strange answer, but um, if you, a single human lifetime is not enough time to build a proper big brand, proper. 
It's a multi-generational thing. It strikes me as fascinating. There are certain brands who, by dint of genetics or something else, the kids clearly get it, handed down to them. The same entrepreneurial DNA thing that the mum or the dad had. There are other brands where it's gone in a generation and they're fucked and they'll never get it back. So of all the things, weirdly, that really behoove a very strong brand, it's the ability to pass it on. And I think that's partly luck and genetics. I mean, the, the example is Hennessy, right? There have been seven sons since Richard Hennessy, the assassin, created Hennessy's brand. He was an assassin, right? Um, but how good's that? Oh, mate, it's, it's a story that no one has told, right? Richard Hennessy is, you know, a Catholic assassin, you know, you know, he's a soldier, a mercenary, an incredibly tough, brilliant guy that's traveled around the world, right? And he has seven sons, each of whom inherit that same focus, all the way down to Gilles Hennessy. And even Gilles' son, Killian Hennessy, who's not in the business, launched one of the most amazing, successful premium fragrances in the world called Killian, um, which is an amazing fragrance. He's got it, man. He's got it, right? And I remember some of the guys from Moa, Tennessee, went out to visit Killian. And I said to him, like, has he got it? He went, oh, yeah, he's got it, man. He's got it. So if, if a founder can have anything, it's an ability to pass it, maybe not necessarily down, but across, so that it continues after them. A lot of these brands shut down because there isn't that, you know, uh, that transformation to the next generation. Brands have to live forever to be successful. It's not, one lifetime is not enough to be a properly successful brand. Yeah. Well, I wonder if there's a connection there between, you know, just the, the, the kid being around it. Yeah. And just seeing it from a young age. I just wonder. Like, I mean, I, I mean that's a, it sounds like I'm being, that's a silly kind of thing to say, but. No, no, it's not at all. It's mm -hmm. not at all. It's the passion for these businesses and seeing your mum and or your dad do this it's an it's an astonish it's an astonishing thing to have that intergenerational connection mm. astonishing there's something else you know there's something magic about it it's it's really magical how it works mm. mark i want to say a massive thank you it's, Mate, it's been, been an absolute pleasure. pleasure um you know again i could I, I wish i could sit here for the next 10 hours and do it <laughs> and i wish we could do it over wine because that would Danger. be twice as twice as you know twice as fun and, and probably twice as interesting for the audience but um no a massive thank you for you and your time um i'm sold i'm gonna i'm gonna enroll that's great man um, i've made my money then it's been a good and, sales the, and the team but you know I, I, i'm gonna enroll so I, I definitely you know everyone who's listening make sure you go check it out um, please do we'd love where it. can they check it out by uh, the way if you just google search mini mba in marketing you'll see all the details we run it twice a year and we take any marketer that wants to do it and um we'd love to have you down the track. beautiful again thank you very much donnie thanks for putting this together and We've had a two-week break. We're back. Um, so, but you know, the support that we've we've had this year has just been phenomenal. Phenomenal. Um, so, to you guys, we're we're, we're obviously back uh, turning the wheel. But you know, a massive thank you to you guys for all the support. As always, uh, I really hope you enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you next week.